this situation? What is this all about? What is the purpose of Jesus doing this miracle out here? Because he, he always did things with a purpose. They, it demonstrated, it showed something, it fulfilled prophecy. And it certainly did. John 6, 14 through 15, excuse me. John 6, 14 through 15. This is the identical account. And it just tells us a little more about the situation. So Jesus fed the masses. And then it says this. Therefore, when the people saw the sign, what sign? This is a specific sign that they saw. When they saw the sign which he had performed, they said, and so what sign? The fact that he multiplied all this food. So the masses understood what happened. They somehow saw this miracle taking place. They said this, this is truly the prophet, the prophet not a prophet. They said, this is truly the prophet who has come into the world. Verse 15 says, so Jesus perceiving that they were intending to come and take him and force by force to make him king, withdrew again to the mountain by himself alone. We see from other context, he sent the disciples ahead of him across the across the Sea of Galilee, and then he dismissed the crowds and got away by himself. They were desiring to take him by force and make him king. You're like, they were saying, this is the prophet. Who is the prophet? And why do they think it's Jesus? Deuteronomy 18, 15 said this, the Lord your God, and this is Moses speaking to the people by the command, by the words of Yahweh, he says, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your countrymen. You should listen to him. Just think of the significance of a prophecy like this from a thousand years before Jesus. Moses predicts, again, he's prophesying by, by Yahweh, but he tells them that not only is there going to be a prophet like me, but he's also going to be among your countrymen, meaning he's going to be Jewish. This is why Jesus was a Jew. It was prophesied from so long ago. And, and Moses said, and you shall listen to him. And with Moses, like what he spoke was the words of Yahweh. Yahweh spoke to him face to face and told him the exact commandments, the exact laws, said, write them down, Moses. And so to the people, it was like the voice of God speaking to them. In fact, God tried to speak to the people um, from Mount Sinai, and they were terrified of Yahweh's voice and the power, and they saw that they were sinners, and they were like, it's going to kill us. And they said, Moses, how about you go talk to him, and you relay everything back to us, okay? And so it was like the words of the Father himself. And so Moses says, there's going to arise a prophet like me from among you. Deuteronomy 33, 9 through 10. And Deuteronomy 33 is recognized by scholars and historians to be a different writer. The rest of Deuteronomy is Moses and other people who are penning and stuff, but it's written a certain way. And then it changes in Deuteronomy 33. Why? Because Moses has already passed away. And in fact, the writing of Deuteronomy 33 is somebody many years later adding and just um, basically putting a end note on the, the scriptures of Deuteronomy and, and telling a little bit more of what happened in the years after. Verse 9, they say this, Now Joshua, the son of Nun, was filled with the spirit of wisdom, for Moses had laid his hands on him, and the sons of Israel listened to him and did as the Lord had commanded Moses. Since that time, no prophet has risen in Israel like Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face. So the person writing this and putting this into Deuteronomy, there have been, there's been Joshua, there have been other prophets already, but he recognizes there's nobody who's ever arisen like Moses. Joshua wasn't even like Moses. 
God did amazing things through Joshua, but Moses talked to Yahweh face to face. And again, he would have been seeing the second person of the Trinity pre-incarnate um, because we can see the son, but nobody can see the father and live. And so he spoke with them face to face. And it's recognized here that didn't happen with Joshua. It happened once. It's recorded one time that he met with the angel of the Lord, which was likely Jesus. Um, but it's recorded one time, whereas Moses, he would meet with Yahweh face to face. And so the writer recognizes the prophet never came. And it was recognized in the time of Jesus, even with Elijah and Elisha and Isaiah and Jeremiah, it was recognized universally by all the people of Israel. This, there was no debate about it. That was recognized there's been no prophet like Moses yet. There hasn't been one. We, we haven't had the one who meets face to face with Yahweh and we're supposed to listen to everything he says. Moses, Moses prophesied it and that prophet never came. So notice the people's words here. They were waiting for the Messiah. They were waiting for the prophet that was prophesied. Not a prophet, not one of the prophets of old. They were never recognized as the prophet. This one, they're like, this is the prophet prophet. Why did they say that? Because they saw the sign. What sign? They're out in the desert. They have no food. They have no supplies. And a prophet, the prophet, provides and multiplies food out of nowhere. What does that sound like? When is the only other time that this happened in Israel's history? The 40 years in the desert with Moses. Moses and again, it was Yahweh who did it, but manna from heaven came and provided for the people in the desert when they did not have any food or supplies. He provided food for them. And so it, this makes more sense now. They're sitting there seeing this and they're like, this is the prophet that was prophesied of old. Finally, one like Moses. And they're, they're, they're connecting the dots. They're like, not only that, look at the amount of healings he does. Not only that, maybe they've heard some of his wording where he's like, I only do what I see the Father doing. Okay, Where he claims like he's got an a inside connection with the Father. Um, much like Moses did who met with him face to face. And Moses only spoke the words that Yahweh was telling him to speak. As far as what Moses wrote down in the commandments, Moses wasn't going off the cuff. He only wrote down what Yahweh told him to write down. Do you see the correlation here? Jesus came, he said, I only do what I see the Father doing. I and the Father are one. Everything he tells me, I'm telling you. Okay, so you see the amazing correlation here. So they're seeing all the miracles, they're hearing all the things, and then they see they're out in a desolate place and food has been provided for a mass, 5,000 people from five loaves and two fish. And even if some people towards the back of the crowd, I mean, word would have spread this miracle that was taking place, but even people towards the back of the crowd, they would be like, well, how did, where did this come from? There's not some huge supply cart out here. Like we don't, we don't see a big, they didn't use wagons. Uh, but I don't know. We don't see like, where did they get this massive supply of food to feed all of us? So they realize this is a correlation to what happened in the desert. And this is the prophet that was prophesied. Moses told us to look for one who was from our own countrymen and that we were to listen to him. When he came, a prophet like Moses, who met with God face to face. Remember, that's what Deuteronomy said, that they said no prophet has risen in Israel that was like Moses, who knew the Lord face to face. Jesus knew the Lord face to face, right? Father, Son, and Spirit, they've known each other uh, forever. How will we understand that? I don't know. We try to. But... Look at Jesus confirming that this is what the miracle was about. Check this out. This is John 6, 26 through 40, and then 47 through 51, and those will be the ones that we end on. 
But first, let's just read 26 through 40, and then we'll just kind of summarize it. We won't go back verse by verse. Jesus answered them and said, Truly, truly, I say to you, you seek me, not because you saw signs, but because you ate of the loaves and were filled. So, timeline for this John account here. Jesus fed the crowds and then sent the disciples across the way. He dismissed the crowds. He went up on the mountain to pray. And then he walked out on the water, met with the disciples. The crowds figured out where he was going Okay, after he dismissed them and he fled away to the mountainside somewhere, got by himself. They saw where they were going and the crowds followed him to the other side of the lake. And so there's a large crowd and they're, they're seeking him again. And Jesus answered them and he said, Truly, truly, I say to you, you seek me not because you saw signs, but because you ate of the loaves and were filled. Now this is an interesting thing because the sign was the loaves. The sign was the the multiplication of all this food. But he's telling them, I believe this is what he's saying here, you guys are seeking me to fulfill your earthly needs. You have you ate of the loaves and you were filled. They were expecting to set up an earthly king who was going to fulfill their physical needs on the earth. That's what they wanted. And he's saying that's why you're seeking me. You want to set me up as king. You want me to fulfill your earthly needs. Now he's there for something far more important. Is it an earthly need to be forgiven of our sins? Yes, it is. Uh, But it's a deep spiritual need. We need to be forgiven of our sins. To confirm that this is what Jesus is talking about, we continue. Verse 27. He said, Do not work for the food which perishes. Meaning like the loaves fulfilling you, that was neat. You want, you want me to be, you know, an earthly king that's going to set everything up and make everything right for you. He's saying, don't work for that kind of food, which perishes, but for the food which endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you. For on him the Father has set his seal. Therefore they said to him, what shall we do so that we may work the works of God? Jesus answered them, answered and said to them, this is the work of God that you believe in him who he has sent. That's the work of God. So the whole thing was always pointing to Jesus. This whole picture that he did out in the desert. He was saying, what you need to do as a result of what you saw, you need to believe on him who he has sent. The Father sent me, you need to believe on me. So they said to him, What then do you do, or what then do you, yeah, do you do? Uh, What then do you do for a sign so that we may see and believe you? What work do you perform? They're like, show off, do some more. And they continue on. Our fathers ate the manna in the wilderness, as it is written, he gave them bread out of heaven to eat. So see how they're connecting this together? They're like, we've already seen you do one, but can you do more, basically? Can you show us a sign that you're that prophet? That we're supposed to listen to? Jesus then said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, it is not Moses who has given you the bread out of heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread out of heaven. For the bread of God is that which comes down out of heaven and gives life to the world. What's he talking about? Himself. He's saying, I am the bread of life. And The bread on earth here, it doesn't do much for you. It's okay, it meets your physical needs. But the bread of life, Jesus Christ, and the sacrifice he's going to do for us on the cross, this bread of life, if you partake of it, you'll have eternal life. We'll see this as it continues on. Then they said to him, Lord, always give us this bread. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will not hunger, and he who believes in me will never thirst. But I say to you that you have seen me and yet do not believe. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and the one who comes to me I will certainly not cast out. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. This is the will of him who sent me. That of all that he has given me, I lose nothing but raise it up on the last day. Speaking of our resurrection um, and 
that if we've come to the Lord, we've been we've been given to the Lord, and we're one of his own, he will raise us up. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who beholds the Son and believes in him will have eternal life. And I myself will raise him up on the last day. So again, what was the purpose of Jesus feeding the crowds? It was to show us that he was the prophet like Moses. That just as with Moses um, and, and the manna in the wilderness, and that manna was a foreshadow. It, it really happened, but it was a foreshadow. It was always pointing to the one who sustains us for eternity. The true bread that comes down from heaven is Jesus. He continues on. We've, we've skipped some verses. We're down at verse 47. He says a lot of amazing things here. Coming into a close, we got four more verses. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your fathers, I I love this part. Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness and they died. So remember Jesus earlier said like, look, you're seeking because you, you had your fill of the loaves. You want me to set up a kingdom here and take care of your physical needs. I'm talking to you about something far more important eternal life the actual bread that comes down from heaven and now he makes the correlation clearly he jesus is correlating what he did in the desert the day before two days before i don't know how long but what happened there he's correlating it to the manna in the desert and he's saying just as that happened yahweh has again sent down the true bread of life and if you partake of it You can have eternal life. You can eat and be satisfied forever. He says, your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness and they died. This is the bread which comes down out of heaven so that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down out of heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread also which I give for the life of the world is my flesh. Now, this confused the people. This is one of those things where we were supposed to look back in hindsight and be like, we know what he was saying now. We know what he was talking about. Now, for the disciples, when because the end of this scene, a whole crowd leaves him because he just keeps pushing it. He's like, you got to eat my flesh. You got to drink my blood. He's talking to them about spiritual things. And instead, they just take offense and leave. But the disciples who they don't fully get this yet, they don't understand it. But they know this is the Messiah. And Peter's like, where can we go? You have the words of eternal life. We believe you. We don't, we don't know what in the world you're talking about. But we believe that you're the Messiah. And looking back, they were like, oh my gosh. Here's the bread that he gives us to eat. He says, the bread which I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. What does that mean? The flesh that he gave was the sacrifice of the cross. Remember the Passover lamb? You were to eat the entire, you were to consume the whole Passover lamb before the next morning. This thing that died on your behalf and the blood is is put on the doorpost and then you consume it. Jesus is saying, I am the Passover lamb and the, the bread that comes down out of heaven is me giving up my flesh on the cross that that's the flesh we're to eat of so we're not physically eating that flesh it's saying metaphorically we come and we feast of the cross we realize that that sacrifice is my everything now i that's how i partake of the sacrifice i put my faith fully in him that he is the bread that came down and he died in my place and the, the bread that he is, it was his flesh, his very flesh being beaten, taking on the sins of the world. That's what I partake of. How awesome is all this? So in case you were ever wondering, what did this whole story mean of him feeding the crowds in the wilderness? Yes, there's all kinds of things we could glean from it. It's, it's amazing. It's the power of God on display. It's his, his love and compassion for the people. It's pretty neat, right? All of that. But here in John, he literally tells us what this was supposed to show us. 
He was making a demonstration that he is the bread of life and we get to partake of it for eternity. Just as here on earth he demonstrated, look, I can give you as much as I want. You got 12 baskets left over, I could give you more. Well, likewise with eternal life, he will give it to us forever. He will sustain us forevermore. He is the bread of life. If you want that bread of life and you don't have it, you need to repent of your sins. Bow your knees at the foot of the cross and recognize this is the bread of life. This is the bread that leads to eternal life. It's Jesus Christ. It's his flesh that he gave to us, sacrificing himself on the cross for my sins. I'm not good. I don't deserve heaven. He took my place. I love you guys. I know I share the gospel every week. I sound like a broken record and I don't care. I'm excited about it every single week. Isn't that amazing? The gospel message does not get old. (laughs) And the gospel message is on every page of the gospel of Luke. Everything is always pointing to Christ and him crucified and what he did for me. And I need to be reminded every single week and it doesn't get old. I'm not like, oh, this again. I'm like, oh, this again. Yes, he saved me, he redeemed me, he loves me, he paid for my sins. This again? Yes, yes, yes. For eternity, this will be my song. This will be my praise to him, what he did for me. Love you guys. I've got uh, one more message for you next week. It will be shorter. This is the only one of of all the messages that actually took up the whole time. Um, Anyways. Next week's will be shorter, and then I think uh, Mayor and Karen are going to share something with you guys. All right. Love ya. Bye.